we showed 10% or so, or above improvement over the best of the art algorithms for uh, essentially uh, extraction or nlp task so this this part is extremely <coughs> important um, as you go along things become even more important when you start talking about uh, not just and simple entities like uh, name of person or uh, you know name of organization or address but when you start talking about now let's say dosage so 2 mg dose of subaxon that kind of thing uh, would be um, much harder to do without uh, an explicit knowledge modeling so to to very long you know to it has been um, so many people have done work on nlp tasks and yet uh, they have uh, you know not used knowledge explicitly and that is the clear opportunity two more quick point i want to make is that um, our team is working on some of the uh, an interesting extension of the kind of knowledge we capture so one of the type of knowledge that we want to now capture is process knowledge um, so uh, one of the students is working on uh, cooking um, you know uh, and in, in cooking uh, you know the cooking process you do this then the step this and the step this this is very critical knowledge and uh, such a knowledge uh, is very helpful in variety of downstream task uh, another example is we are working with mental health and clinical guideline that doctor have to use doctors have to use clinical guideline to make diagnosis they can't just do it arbitrarily uh, and so the machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm that has to that is trying to also mimic uh, the same kind of um, uh, activity uh, you know uh, like uh, think like a doctor does will have to incorporate that kind of knowledge and and um, i we, we should you know look out for opportunity in the case of pharma, uh, where uh, some modeling of process knowledge will be valuable and that could be very valuable uh, one other student has worked on uh, and has a small paper on process knowledge in sales um, you know a sales pipeline when you uh, when sales people are trying to uh, complete a uh, purchase by a customer uh, then then that there's a process knowledge who who is involved in purchasing decision uh, and that is also something that you will model in the knowledge graph and that this is what makes the uh, you know all these techniques far richer than otherwise go ahead right so uh, in in a domain like this to understand Suboxon, uh, you you don't just want the text part of it. You want also meaningful links to other things that make up human understanding of that term in this particular context. Like what can it cause? What is the dosage amount? What side effects that it does it have? How how is it administered and so on? To get all that stuff from uh, a textual document uh, where it doesn't actually explicitly mention any of this stuff, uh, the neural network. Uh, no matter how big and large and how engineering uh, of it has been carried out, it cannot uh, understand all those things without explicit explicit mention of it. So we will need explicit knowledge graph uh, infusion into the deep learning pipeline for it to gain understanding of the terms of axon as a human would. So now, uh, given that, how do you actually infuse knowledge in the deep learning pipeline? Uh, there, we have uh, categorized it into three types of um, infusion techniques. The first one is called shallow infusion. So the schematic for that you see before you. So what this means is that you take the knowledge graph and then you construct a distributed representation for the entities in the knowledge graph. For example, a knowledge graph embedding method. Then what you can do is the take the word to vec or textual re representation of a suboxone and then the knowledge graph representation of say suboxone, concatenate the two and then change nothing else in the deep learning pipeline. Everything else can stay the same. The reason it is called shallow infusion is because you're modifying everything at the input level. You take two kinds of embeddings and concatenate it and nothing else needs to change after that. Well, I think we also call it shallow for the reason that um, really the uh, the richness of knowledge representation is not uh, properly exploited here. So when you uh, create a uh, a vector from a, uh, a richer uh, uh, so so when you create a vector from data, 
uh, there is a, a, a you are, you're basically capturing a lot of statistics on which word appears where in what order and you know who which follows what. When you create a vector from a knowledge representation, uh, a knowledge representation is an explicit relationship, even label relationship. All of those uh, things are lost. Uh, so, so uh, a limited uh, um, aspect of knowledge gets captured in a in a uh, form to be compatible with uh, vectors that are used for uh, um, for for data, uh, so that you can do your you know familiar operation on the vectors. Uh, but then you lose uh, out on on good bit of uh, knowledge, and the knowledge <coughs> uh, you know shallow when you uh, go from a richer knowledge representation like a graph or label graph or you know or directed label graph to a vector uh, and um, so the idea is and that's why i've been uh, you know urging uh, our team to start uh, moving the data processing from vector to uh, gnn um, uh, you know which is a richer form uh, that will show some improvement and then go beyond that of course all that come at the cost of uh, performance. I mean, it will be, uh, you know, uh, more uh, compute incentive. But this, that, that is a well-known expressiveness computational compute, computation trade-off, and we really need to move towards uh, more richness as we go. I have a, I have a quick question here. So, uh, in, at the basic level, possibly we are using some kind of, you know, not to wake or variation of that, right? A derivation of the similar kind. To get the embedding of that particular node from the knowledge graph. Yes, and that's right. That so, using a vector, you know, as an infusion towards the you know neural network methods, right? I mean, that's right. the understanding. Okay, right. good. Yeah, so when sure. you you use node to vec to um, illustrate Dr. Shet's point earlier, is node to vec is uh, usually a simple graph embedding method, but a knowledge graph has relationships on the edges it has uh, the schema contained in the ontology the entity types the relationship types all this node to vec a method like node to vec is not designed to capture so invariably when you compress the graph information as a vector using a technique like node to vec you lose information the full extent of information that is present That's in the node Work or derivation of it, as uh, Professor said, also mentioned, you know, graph neural network and you know several other techniques came out in recent times and so on. Mm -hmm. So it might be derivation of that. So I, I have another question. I mean, uh, the the disambiguation part, right? You know, the Watson's disambiguation. So uh, how to you know reach out to that particular? Uh, I mean, there might be multiple entries uh, for a particular entity, entity, right? I mean, because we have multiple senses. So did you explore any method to reach out that particular entity uh, to extract out or how it works? Uh, so if we are integrating two knowledge graphs, if there are two entities, if there is uh, the same entity in both, how do we disambiguate? Is that the question? Yes, yes, yes. OK. Um, for that, we have explored some techniques. There are existing techniques that do that. We are in the process of developing some techniques, the knowledge graph construction team that is usually part of these meetings. Um, generally, so, uh, yeah. Basically, um, uh, we have a, uh, uh, you know, two, three major projects going on. Uh, one of them happened to be uh, in um, construction of knowledge graph itself. Uh, and uh, you know those people are part of this team also. For example, I just saw uh, you know at uh, one meet ago, uh, uh, Joey uh, Yip uh, joined, and he's uh, leading a team uh, to construct uh, uh, to develop a toolkit to uh, you know more rapidly create and enhance knowledge graphs. And uh, there. Um, um, uh, you know now now our work in broadening this area is also also called ontology alignment goal in, you know is pretty old uh, we you know in fact um, uh, just as an aside uh, we got 10 year award um, from ISWC conference semantic web conference uh, last year for our paper in 2010 on ontology alignment uh, but these are hard issues and uh, um, now in recent years because of the importance of knowledge graph a lot more people have jumped into this um, and uh, what in our case because 
in practically every what we do uh, because of you know we need knowledge graph to do knowledge infused learning uh, and in some cases knowledge graph exists in other cases uh, we have to develop knowledge graph uh, domain specific knowledge graph so um, um, a while ago when i had my second company tali and simagics we had developed a fantastic toolkit for uh, you know creating and enhancing knowledge graph and um, unfortunately i you know well because i had a company i never made it open source or public and then company was sold um, so i don't i didn't get the get to keep the software but we need to recreate a software of that kind uh, you know with of course more features uh, and uh, that is where this kind of <coughs> picture so there is a big uh, body of work including our own work for example uh, extracting uh, triples or or facts from electronic medical records to enhance existing uh, clinical knowledge graph um, and uh, these class of problems of um, uh, disambiguation when you, on merging the you know knowledge graph uh, that these, there is a long line of work uh, we need to we are also looking at that kind of work because we work on you know for kiro kind of project with pharma we work on mental health we work on several other projects uh, work on disaster coordination uh, there is a need for knowledge graph for all of them and hence we want to have our own toolkit to more rapidly create and maintain knowledge graph it's not a easy problem but that's you know separate uh, sort of line of activities that we continue work on uh, any of your students want to join a discussion usually we have meetings on wednesdays uh, and uh, we discuss the progress in that area or or also they can join the knowledge graph group for the ai institute uh, there is a linkedin group on knowledge graph where we discuss uh, these you know number of issues of this type that's good so yeah anubhav and uh, niharika and uh, rushil probably shomu is not there so please join this group and so that you can also learn yeah. yes yes so so from our team also i think uh, so we would like to join so when is that hot time uh, uh, the the meeting time is 9:30 am Okay. Um, on on Wednesdays. Um, okay. 9:30 p.m. Okay, so we just so so Diksha and uh, Aizan. So please note this timing. Okay. Yeah, and and yes, even that make sure yes, uh, you know a, a knowledge graph a LinkedIn group. I'll put the link here so you can invite yourself. Yes, yes, that will be good. Yes. Okay, Kaushik, continue. Okay. So the second type of uh, knowledge infusion, the uh, category uh, we call as semi-deep infusion. So in shallow infusion, remember that the uh, um, knowledge is captured uh, as a vector for passing into the deep learning pipeline. But in semi-deep infusion, whatever be the parameterization of the deep learning method that we are using, uh, those parameters are directly uh, modified using the explicit knowledge. So I'll show you an example of that so that it becomes more clear. So first for shallow infusion, uh, probably it's already clear what happened in shallow infusion, but just in case. So we see here that uh, there's a COVID-19 related knowledge graph and you get extract triples related to the COVID-19 context from this knowledge graph. And you use some embedding model like node to vec some tensor factorization model to get the embeddings for the nodes and their relationships and then concatenate that with the input representation for a graph convolutional neural network in this case and predict the question answer to the question and, uh, so here um, we can see that this uh, the question is shelter in place causes anxiety or not so why we get advantage by using this technique is that causes is explicitly contained in this knowledge graph and somehow that has been captured in the vector so we can uh, try to answer prediction problem like this something cause something else or prevent something else so <clears throat> now uh, an example of semi-deep infusion let's first see what happens without knowledge if we are trying to figure out that this piece of text has uh, something mental re mental health related and what kind of mental health condition is this um, exhibiting so right now if we pass it through a attention based uh, transformer there's some prediction probability to yes it is mental health related and no but that's all you get from this 
right? It doesn't tell you much more than that or uh, and we'd like to know more than that. If you visualize the attention matrix, you get the highlighted terms in bold and then Typically what happens is that you give it to a domain expert and they try to interpret those highlights in, ad in addition to the prediction probability. Hey, Kaushik, uh, yeah. several of our team is here. I just want to make a point. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to figure out a way to uh, make, you know, these um, the attention metrics um, uh, uh, and, you know, richer. Uh, so look at that word causing causing chaos in my relationship. And at some point of time, we need to, um, uh, you know, try and figure out um, uh, uh, this kind of relationship uh, centric uh, uh, information that is in the text. Uh, it's uh, now starting to get done because there's because there. So there is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I would really love for us to develop techniques that are um, that, that are better at exploiting relationship than, uh, you know, the state of the art. Uh, we are, you know, uh, generally speaking at a very broad level, um, there is a lot of attention to the entities, but not as much to relationship. And that is a great opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, Right, so the example that I'll proceed to show now is at more at modeling the relationship between entities. So we should definitely uh, extend that to capture relationships more explicitly. And uh, so now what happens when we use a knowledge graph? So here, uh, first of all, we have to uh, contextualize within mental health. So for that, we uh, use a knowledge graph uh, that is pertinent to mental health, like DSM-5. Now, imagine that as being uh, chapters related to various diseases like uh, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. It has um, everything related to psychiatric illnesses, this, this DSM-5 knowledge graph. Now, we can create an attention matrix uh, or a correlation matrix which correlates concepts in the DSM-5 with phrases in the text. In when you do that, you modulate the interphrase attention that was originally present. What do I mean by interphrase attention? Uh, if struggling and bisexuality in the original attention matrix were not that highly related, once you map it to a concept in the DSM-5, um, they become highly correlated. So when that correlation is captured, the model's confidence on is this uh, piece of text mental health related increases and you get added benefits. The added benefit that you get is that why did the model now choose to put struggling and bisexuality as highly correlated? You can get the answer to that by uh, looking at the definitions in the knowledge graph. Okay, I have a question. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. I mean, if we just go back to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So this correlation matrix is a you know sentence level or something or corpus level, and uh, what does it represent? I mean, it is something collocation or it is something uh, more to that. That's what it is. So in a, uh, a transformer model, there's a self-attention matrix which is a correlation matrix, and it represents uh, the strength of assumptions between uh, phrases in the text with respect to the outcome. So it could be token level, n-gram level, but at the end, if the transformer model is contains an entry in the self-attention matrix, it's saying that these, these two words occur frequently together in this context for this prediction problem. Does, does yeah. that answer so, the question? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so problem specific when we are doing the back propagation, so we are basically learning these uh, relations. Okay, understood. Right. And yeah. Yeah. One 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 I have a question, but how, so Kaushik, how you are mapping it to the DSM-5 concept because as I understand that your um, uh, attention is for this particular given text, right? Like for example, struggling, bisexuality, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of concept. So now uh, uh, when do you map it to the concept of DSM-5 concept? Uh, okay, so for example, here on this corner, you can see the DSM-5 definition for obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Okay. And now we can see phrases that the attention matrix captured that are part of the definition. And 
okay. if previously the those phrases did not have high correlation now they do because the knowledge graph shows us that they're part of the same definition uh, of a disease in the contained in the dsm okay right and you can get an explanation for the highlighted entities by tracing the knowledge graph itself uh, it's not really that an explanation yet. It still needs to be interpreted by an expert, but it gives us a visual, uh, visually rich information um, for the expert to interpret rather than just highlight phrases in the text. Yeah, right? I, you know, at a uh, fundamental level, I feel that uh, we have just kind of um, uh, started uh, things that are richer than what uh, you know, deep learning people do now with a data centric do now, but we have not gone uh, far enough. Uh, so, um, you know, what you see uh, here um, uh, on, on the bottom, there are this purple thing. Um, inclusive thought it, 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 you know, belongs to disturbance and content of thought, belongs to disturbance and thinking. Um, that power of knowledge uh, in you know you know in you know sort of cascading relationship or connected uh, relationship that is i believe not being exploited by what we do now and i would like to you know move towards um, being able to do that our human brains would do that very very well uh, again i'll refer the students to uh, 1945 paper uh, as you may think by whenever bush and his idea about um, trail busy so our human mind makes these connections very, very effective. Uh, in so far, we are only boosting the statistical connection because of this relationship. But we are not, um, you know, for example, we don't have, I think, the concept of transitive relationship because the richness of the um, model in which we manipulate that uh, to be aligned with the transformer uh, based systems is not high. Uh, so that we are missing out on uh, some of this richness and there is a huge opportunity uh, uh, for us to do that. It may be, you know, and I like to make this analogy. Um, uh, the idea of deep learning, neural network and deep learning was not new, uh, but only with the increase in computational power in 2012, yeah. around that, uh, people become very comfortable uh, doing that um, and with GPUs and such. Um, the same here. Um, I think that uh, we should get comfortable and push the envelope to uh, bring in more richness in the computation, which will originally, which will initially sound to be extremely um, uh, compute intensive and challenging, but the, uh, but eventually uh, it can be, you know, that can end up being a path breaking work where the other people will help us find ways to uh, do it more efficiently. Uh, the other point I want to make here is that. Um, uh, uh, we we want to be able to um, uh, utilize the uh, medical knowledge, which also means that we want to uh, utilize the definition of the term. So here on the top right, you see obsessive compulsive disorder. What it is that is being defined. Uh, you know, it's like a dictionary definition, and um, that definition needs to be uh, more effectively used. Uh, now we are uh, starting to use that in uh, constructing explanation. One of the biggest uh, benefit of our uh, approach in knowledge infused learning, because you know ultimately this is making this you know you, you see all these connections, the arrows that are moving around. Because of that, we are going to be able to construct the explanation in terms of what users want it, uh, or, or the way users understand. So. So anybody who is a medical professional uh, in mental health would understand, would have read the OCD um, definition. And when you describe somebody that I found this content to be related to OCD because it matches this definition, that is a very well accepted thing. Compare that with the explanation that people talk about in deep learning. There is nothing like that. That, that explanation is in terms of what method got used to process the data, that that has very little value to the end users, uh, to the uh, you know to the clinician in this particular case, right? They would want to have explanation in the form that is directly utilized by the 
you know by that person by that that user by the decision maker and hence uh, but anyway our ability to um, uh, utilize this medical knowledge uh, in crafting the explanation after having understood these um, terms all of these uh, all of these uh, brown terms are better understood uh, compared to uh, because they are linked it's called uh, uplifting or entity linking that right? this is entity linking when you link a, um, a content item uh, into to 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 an to a concept item uh, which is uh, you know like high high bisexual behavior is a concept um, in a knowledge graph then you are doing entity linking it's also called uplifting you are lifting uh, the uh, something that is syntactic uh, bisexuality is a syntactic thing to a semantic thing high risk bisexual behavior uh, which has more meaning so when you do this uh, it gives you then the ability to then utilize these kind of definitions to create explanations in the form that is utilized by end user this makes for a huge improvement in what we can do and that's why uh, we we been you know working on explainability and 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 making trying to make you know others understand that uh, the explanation that people talk about in ai is very different than explanation that actually users need and that we can get there mm, okay sounds great so i i have a you know quick question here uh, so typical uh, graph embedding technique captures the topology uh, but you know in knowledge graph we possibly need the relations also to be captured and what you have been mentioning here the relation between entities and all those things so uh, so what kind of technique is being used to you know keep that relation intact in those embedding whatever you were extracting from the graph currently um there are techniques that uh, have tensor factorization methods so mm -hmm. instead of uh, matrix yeah. factorization you add a third dimension and you get the relationship but that still does yeah. not account for the types of the entities and the relationship type so the ontological schema it's being improved slowly because the like you said the topology uh, mathematically has to be richer to allow for that for uh, in the node linking level but currently this vector space based um, representation suffices but as you add more richness to the knowledge graph the vector space based thing may not be enough you may actually have to explicitly use the knowledge graph to control for the outcomes generated by the neural network without actually putting it into the parameters or the vector space that the neural network operates on. Kaushik, uh, I have an idea and, and write it down also make a note of it. Uh, mm. what, what we try to do is, is essentially uh, do uh, you know computation in one shot uh, where um, we have a representation of what is in the data and we have a representation of what is in the knowledge graph. And we uh, have the ability to make these connections, uh, simple connections like the ones that uh, we have here. Uh, but, but what we may want to uh, go towards is a two-tier computational model where we do what we are doing now, but then uh, take it to the next layer uh, in a in a uh, fairly um, in, a, in a form which actually uses um, uh, label graph computation. And uh, at that level, uh, we can of course you know uh, uh, we can bring get into somewhat of a symbolic uh, uh, framework and do the reasoning uh, that kind of thing would be um, um, you know it's very natural i mean my own um, uh, you know um, hypothesis is uh, that uh, and you've seen this is something we need to uh, work on is that um, the human brain supports both perception and cognition uh, and uh, perception is uh, very close to these deep learning techniques and the, st the statistical learning that is happening. Uh, and it is very fast. And uh, cognitive, uh, you know, uh, computing, uh, uh, where we are, uh, you know, uh, having more, ha doing more conscious decision making is system two kind of thing. It's slower. So, you know, uh, so, so. Uh, what we what uh, but our brain uh, you know does this very very well and effectively uh, and um, you know one 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 slide from one of my keynote says that uh, we human brain is bombarded with 11 million bits per second of sensory information but um, 
it, it then converts that into 50, 60, 70 bits of um, uh, information uh, that it explicitly, you know, uh, uh, works on in a, in a conscious way. So right now, you know, you know, Kaushik's head is bobbling, but uh, uh, or moving, but uh, you know, it's something I don't pay attention to, right? And our brain is able to uh, take it away uh, and pay attention to what Kaushik says or the, what he says in the slide. Uh, and um, uh, so, so this uh, ability that our brain has uh, 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 does, uh, you know, exploit different um, aspects of computations, different, uh, you know. And so you do first system one computation and, you know, that 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 is capable of um, noticing uh, somebody's movement as, you know, or, or on a call like this or, or somebody's voice said, oh, OK, this is a voice from um, uh, Amita. But um, uh, then um, we uh, are paying attention to what is being said, what does it mean? That comes down to at a cognitive system two level. So I think with that same kind of thing, we need to uh, start thinking about building a two-tier, uh, you know, system, potentially multi-tier system, which is not simply <coughs> done at the level of this metric manipulation that we are done or vector, vector, you know, uh, uh, level of things that we are doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a big point, and you know, so you you should note that and see if there are, you know, if you are working on really neural models and and, and inspiring AI, this is what you need to get to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doctor. Okay, so now before getting into deep infusion, uh, so far we have seen some types of knowledge graphs. Uh, they were mostly domain specific, but really, what we do when we look at a sentence in natural language is we parse the syntactic and grammatic structure of it because we know English and then the linguistic knowledge that is associated with that. Before even assigning meaning to any of that, we understand it grammatically, syntactically and at a linguistic level. Then we move on to uh, parsing the sentence from a common sense perspective that we know that if we see a door in the sentence, then we know that it can be opened and closed, right? So those relationships become part of our understanding of that sentence. Then we also uh, understand that we are in, in a particular context at the moment, so say mental health. And in that at that point, we bring in the domain specific knowledge graph to enhance our common sense knowledge based understanding of the entity to domain specific knowledge based understanding of the entity. So. In a sense, we are moving from the lowest level, which is the tokens and phrases, to a abstract contextual level of understanding, depending on our end result, what we want to do. So now the issue is that um, we need to develop a neural network architecture that mimics this uh, abstraction process using explicit knowledge so that we can modify the neural network at the, at the appropriate level um, of understanding. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what is called as a deep infusion. So you have uh, multiple layers in the deep network. And just like the typical uh, convolutional neural network example, where to understand an image, they say that uh, you first identify shapes and then that forms uh, more sh uh, meaningful shapes like eyes and nose and mouth, and then that becomes a face. A similar thing, but where the abstractions being formed in the layers of the neural network is controlled by explicit knowledge, uh, uh, driven by our end end goal. So, um, an architecture for that would be a deep learning model that has deep infusion in it. So right now. In the original paper on knowledge infused learning, there is a concept architecture where uh, you have multiple layers leading to an output. And for each layer, you construct what is known as a differential knowledge engine. So you construct a subgraph from your knowledge graph that uh, corresponds to the entities being learned at each layer of the neural network and use that subgraph, which is a different subgraph for each layer, to modulate the parameters of that layer. Um, this is an example, again, from that paper of how that would look like for an LSTM. Uh, since then, there have been uh, transformers developed and, and stuff, but this is 
for example, how a deep infusion architecture would look like in an LSTM. You construct a knowledge graph representation, KE, which is called in this diagram. That doesn't necessarily need to be an embedding based representation. It's just something that the layer, the LSTM layer HT can use to modify that level of abstraction. Similarly, the previous layer would use a different KE and so on. So this, we don't yet have a concrete architecture realized for the deep infusion setup, but that would be uh, uh, very useful in a variety of domains. Right, so that's the end of the presentation. The, these are the three broad categories of knowledge infused learning that we have developed. Semi uh, shallow infusion, semi deep infusion and deep infusion. Yeah, and I think we need to do uh, still a good bit of work on deep infusion. Um, uh, as we can, um, uh, you know, well, you, maybe you can ignore, but I think that um, the um, specific um, uh, uh, deep infusion architecture and, 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 and um, construction in a particular use case uh, will vary by the problem. So if I'm doing, trying to do deep infusion of uh, for natural language understanding, uh, um, in in and so the, the modality is text. That is one thing. If I'm trying to do deep infusion for um, uh, the uh, image uh, or vision content, it will be a different um, a sort of things that are involved. Uh, there may be nothing that may, there is no direct analogy, direct uh, correspondence to let's say common sense knowledge. Uh, or there may be, I don't know, but there may not be anything, you know, directly uh, similar to Wikipedia and Wikipedia kind of uh, text uh, at that type of knowledge. If you're doing image processing as an example, or there are there those kind of visual, visual, um, you know, thazaras are may not be available to us for to exploit. So they will all depend on the task that we do, but. Um, uh, I think it will be it will be very exciting to see see those things. And um, uh, Amitabha, in, in a general sense, given that you are interested in multimodality, uh, there is one uh, uh, slide that is very instructive. Uh, I don't know if you have access to that. Uh, uh, Kaushik, if you have access to my keynote thing, the slide which is about uh, Bay Area traffic, uh, you know, uh, where we have a uh, Twitter and where we have uh, 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 the uh, uh, what do you call um, uh, the 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 road 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 signal uh, uh, data. So uh, not I don't think this might have it. Um, uh, I mean it is, but in my last keynote on uh, in explicit knowledge. Okay. That Sorry. that has that side. Yeah yeah. Oh, that there services here. Yeah. So, so um, uh, again, this is the theory that um, uh, knowledge representation, knowledge, explicit knowledge will be very valuable when you are trying to uh, synchronize and learn from multimodal data. And um, uh, yeah, so that this slide shows, for example, just gives an idea that um, on one side, uh, you see that domain knowledge for traffic flow synthesizes PGM processing graph model from sensor data. And basically, in this work, we uh, represented traffic, um, you know, signals um, uh, that tells you real time continuous um, speed of vehicles on a particular road entity. So that is one form of data. Other form data is when people um, um, tweet saying I saw an accident here. And how do you connect the two? So the modality is very different, but there is a uh, you know common thing about uh, road accident uh, lead to traffic getting slowed down. And that is modeled in the knowledge graph or ontology. And uh, you can see that uh, you know model that in some in the center, you see domain knowledge from concept net. Uh, so active event um, causes delay, right? So there is that uh, knowledge that we have. And using that knowledge, we are able to connect uh, this uh, signal data with uh, textual tweet data, uh, along with the additional extraction of information about spatiotemporal, because there's a lot of uh, tweet, uh, tweets, but um, 
which tweets actually talk about this particular location in a, at that particular time is also important. So with all these, that you are making able to make connection. And now, uh, now come up with you know, imagine you are trying to do that without the uh, without the explicit knowledge here. I don't know how would you do that, right? So, uh, so people are trying to do multimodal machine learning uh, by training across different modality. I feel that that work would be um, incredibly, um, uh, you know, I, I guess it would be very hard to get a high quality there without the use of knowledge, without the use of um, this thing saying, uh, you know, I want to connect the thing because, active, you know, this thing causes delay. Now you can explicitly manually input that data, but uh, it would be nice to just have uh, you know, knowledge representation to help you there, so you can deal with multiple situations more easily. And in this particular, in this general class of issues, uh, so our human brain is extremely good at uh, dealing with multimodalities. You know, we are simultaneously consuming voice and um, text and uh, images and you know videos and all that, uh, and and uh, and we do that very very effectively. And my uh, um, my intuition is, and you know that um, again, uh, the system two, both system one processes that 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 these connections happen more at system two level, not at system one level, and and indirectly I'm imply and, and so I'm implying that uh, deep learning by itself would have a very hard time dealing with it. You need you need to bring it up to the symbolic level to um, uh, you know uh, to to make those connections better and 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 have. Uh, better understanding rather than processing. Yeah, thanks. So in this data set also images, I mean, what kind of images are there in this uh, particular task? Uh, this particular data only had the uh, road traffic uh, signals, uh, the, you know, uh, road traffic data and uh, and tweets. Uh, so the, the idea was to connect the two and see whether uh, tweets from the area of um, a traffic uh, incidents uh, can explain what it is about from the uh, from from the uh, road traffic road road signals uh, you know sensory data i can uh, you know say the traffic is slow at this point at this location uh, but i can't say why uh, okay. and uh, uh, the, we want we connected to the web information uh, from the traffic um, uh, you know department that said uh, we have planned road uh, uh, you know, road work at this place, or uh, uh, for from the you know citizen signal, uh, where uh, you know uh, somebody tweets that I saw a uh, traffic accident here. So, so that is what this was about. In this particular example, we did not have image data, okay. but uh, we have we have started on the. Uh, uh, Actually, now already three smart uh, manufacturing projects, and there uh, you know you have a, a cell uh, and uh, ability to take um, you know video and uh, all kinds of uh, you know highly instrumented uh, situation where you can have multimodality, multimodal data coming in. So there you'll be able to construct more rich examples. Okay. Okay. But uh, sir, the, um, the knowledge is mainly coming from the text only, right? So in this uh, situation. No, the knowledge, there are three ontologies we used here. Okay. Uh, one was um, uh, related to location, open state map. Another was a, a city, um, uh, a city, uh, uh, smart city ontology IBM had developed. And third was ConceptNet. In this, in this here you see example from the ConceptNet. ConceptNet has traffic accident cause, you know, causes delay in, uh, you know, uh, and traffic jam, that kind of thing. So that is already in, so that is what uh, humans have designed this. Uh, you know, one of the things that most AI research, many statistical AI researchers have no idea is that there already exists so much of human uh, delay, you know, developed um, uh, uh, structured knowledges. This is done by people over, uh, you know, they have toiled for many, uh, you know, many, many, many uh, years to come up with this knowledge. Why not exploit it? Okay. And, uh, many people collaborate in creating the, this knowledge. So it happens, you know, that um, set of a set of uh, um, uh, knowledge graphs that uh, Kaushik showed, uh, you know, um, at a domain level, you, in medical case, you have UMLS as an example. 
UMLS is constructed by so many people working over so such a long time. That power should be directly exploited. Okay. And uh, the, the deep learning guys simply uh, fail uh, to, you know, they, they just don't have that uh, thing in their pipeline. And, and, the, yeah. problem, the, and, and the problem is that um, you try to publish a paper in a uh, in a NLP conference, they all are kind of uh, familiar with glue and super glue and you, you know, you are supposed to show your, uh, you know, comparison. But uh, you are doing, uh, you know, apple and orange thing in that uh, you are, uh, your target is only, um, you know, low level thing as this graph, this slide shows, you know, you can only compare uh, glue task, but there are high level tasks. And there are, uh, we need to develop, um, a, you know, um, uh, we need to develop, uh, perhaps we have to really have a shared task and put out the, uh, 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 you know, evaluation, uh, har you know, harness or evaluation uh, target um, so that uh, people can compete at the level they need to. If, if, uh, once we do that, and as we do that, uh, uh, and, and we should, of course, look at the work by Ernie and such. Um, once we do that, uh, we will show, we'll be able to show the value of this kind of knowledge infused learning much better and the uh, state of the art will look much worse. But if you, um, you know, if you have glue task uh, and uh, you compare the state of the art with what we do, well, uh, the, the, the the task or the, the targets uh, evaluation, is, you know, is not fair, uh, is, is too low level. And hence, we, it's hard for us to show the real benefit gain. Mm. Okay. Yes, okay. So, okay. I, I, yeah, please go on. No, 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 no. I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay. So I have actually three questions. Uh, two for Koshik and one actually discussion. Uh, two professor said. So let me start with you know if you you know Koshik, please go back to the presentation. Huh? So initially we discussed about uh, uh, not to vec kind of topological embedding. And then we jump into kind of matrix factorization, right? I mean, typically, you know, singular factor, you know, value decomposition or any kind of similar uh, decomposition method, eigenvalue or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, then uh, finally, the deep infusion and where we are, you know, extracting subgraphs and in the layer of a neural network, we are trying to learn what is the importance and try to infuse. I mean, it's a kind yeah. of summary of what I, what I understand. You know, correct me or you want to you know, add something on that. That's, uh, that's right, I think. Okay. You understand, yeah. Okay, good. Now, uh, to Professor said, I mean, I mean, uh, this is more philosophical, and also Asif uh, would like to hear from you. So, if you look at NLP pipelines, you know, we, we have several layers: so lexical, syntactic, semantics, pragmatics. So, if we look at syntax, still syntax, probably is a solved problem. I mean, people may argue semantics is a half solved problem, and pragmatics is still untouched. People don't know where we are. So. If we think about knowledge graph, are we able to solve something which is not there in the text? We are bringing some world knowledge which is pre-learned, pre-stored, or captured somewhere, and we are trying to, you know, bring that in into our system and trying to solve the problem. I mean, yeah, if, we, we we are we are in that. Um, uh, uh, if you look at that graph that shows a linking to the knowledge uh, you know uh, then um, um, the knowledge is it, it can tell you a lot of things uh, one example i just tried to give you is that um, we represent in the knowledge graph uh, let's say uh, medical guideline mm -hmm. so um, uh, there is nothing like that you can do uh, and now now in fact medical guideline uh, uh, I don't know whether you want to call it semantics or pragmatics, but this is what the doctor would use uh, in in his or her decision making. And um, uh, there is a thing like that uh, in the current uh, NLP, uh, you know, processing. Uh, but uh, if you want to help doctors make the decision, then that is what you have to incorporate. Uh, so it's not in the data, but um, it is what uh, is necessary in the uh, data processing in the processing so that uh, you can uh, help uh, doctors. Doctors, uh, uh, you know, basically today doctors would even um, 
still not use uh, tasks that are shown to be performing better than human uh, because those cannot be explained. Uh, you know, and uh, why? What is the um, uh, not only what is the data about the patient, but what is the medical guidance uh, the, or reference uh, in decision making uh, that allows uh, uh, them to come to some conclusion about the diagnosis or for the treatment they need to choose. And that is all modeled in the knowledge graphs, uh, you know, or, or in these definitions like this one I'm showing. So when we talk about DSM-5, that is the medical knowledge about mental health, which is a full textual uh, knowledge, uh, uh, largely unstructured, some semi-structured. They have chapters and such. And then uh, we create a structured and semi-structured form of that knowledge in, when we create knowledge graph from DSM-5. And then when we incorporate that into the pipeline processing, we have now access to using the data uh, and fill it into, uh, you know, uh, medical decision making process. Uh, and uh, then help doctors say, look, based on this data and this medical guideline, we can help you uh, make this choice. Yeah. Hmm. For example, uh, here there is you see different types of knowledge that just cannot be there in the data. If you have some kind of uh, insomnia coming from restlessness or lack of sleep, you prescribe some medication and then the typical dosage for that medication and frequency of usage. Um, on the bottom uh, corner, there is a flow chart that determines somebody's degree of suicidal thoughts. These things are not usually present in the text. Mm-hmm. 